And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers, and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. This is your brother Imran Hussein, uh, welcoming you again after a break of about two months uh, from this, the studios of the Islamic Broadcasting Network here in my native Caribbean island of Trinidad. Uh, you with a greeting of assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be with you. Uh, this lecture can be viewed on uh, ibntt.com, the website ibntt.com, and also on YouTube Live at IBN Master. Uh, we will speak for about 40 minutes and then at 8.40, if there are any telephone calls, you can call in with your questions. At, uh, the number is um, at 868-645-4426 and 868-663-8373. You can call in with your questions at uh, 840. I have to report to you, alhamdulillah, I returned to Trinidad two days ago, early in the morning. After spending two months abroad traveling in uh, Britain for the first time in many, many years, and in France and in Switzerland. And I'm happy to report that I had no problems, alhamdulillah, in my travels. I was treated with respect by British immigration, by French immigration, and I had no problems as well in Switzerland. We had a seminar on the 29th of July in Geneva uh, on uh, electronic money, digital money. And uh, the subject is still on the front burner. It is the most important subject uh, which we should be directing attention to at this time, the subject of money. That seminar was successfully conducted. And uh, I visited Britain. I was able to meet with my grandson. I have only one grandchild, a grandson in London, and he's three years of age, three years of age, and I never met him. So I was able to meet with Ayman for the first time uh, and uh, have some, spent some time with my grandson. I spent some time with my students in London. I went up to Manchester. I went to Birmingham and so on. And uh, uh, I spent one month in France writing my book on uh, Dajjal, and I'm happy to report to you it is now perhaps 99% completed. Uh, the topic is Dajjal, the Quran, and the Awwalu Zaman, or the beginning of history. Dajjal, the Quran, and the beginning of history, Awwalu Zaman. And perhaps in another one week, I can complete that book, inshallah. And uh, there will be four more books on Dajjal, a total of five books, at least, I hope, not more than five. Uh, the second book after this will be uh, From Jesus, the True Messiah, to Dajjal, the False Messiah, a journey in Islamic eschatology. Uh, that book is already about half finished. It may take me a few months to complete that book. Uh, Insha'Allah. And then the third book will be entitled Dajjal and Money, which is a tough book to write, uh, to simplify the subject so that the scholars of Islam, most of all, uh, would be able to understand the subject because they don't know the subject because it's not taught to them. So I have to write a book on the Dajjal and money that the scholars of Islam will be able to study it so they could understand the subject. Inshallah, it is so important for them to understand it. The fourth book will be on Dajjal and the feminist revolution and Islamic response to the modern feminist revolution and that book, of course, is going to be a surprise to many women, uh, but we, 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 we write our books to please Allah. And if there are those who are happy with what we write, alhamdulillah, and if not, well then what can we do? We must not seek to please the people, 
and displease Allah, we should seek to please Allah, whether it is pleasing or not to the people. So that's book number four, the Jal and Woman. And the fifth and last book, which would be uh, on the Jal, the Quran, and Akhirul Zaman, the last age or the end of history, um, which would not, I hope, be difficult to write. When these five books are finished, then I pray to Allah. If he wants to send the angel, I'm ready to go. But I want time. Please give me time to finish these five books, inshallah. Uh, remember, if you have any questions, you can call in at uh, 8.40, inshallah. Um, I will now be in Trinidad for the next two months. And during these two months, we will now resume our subject of money to try to conclude it. I still have to define money from the Quran and from the Sunnah. Um, so in the next probably two, two, two uh, sessions will be devoted uh, to money. Uh, but in addition to that, during these two months that I'll be in Trinidad, we will organize a private session, not public, private session for businessmen and for those who are interested to study the subject of money with me. A small group, maybe 25, 30 people, and we probably have some pilau to eat and uh, spend a few hours on the subject answering your questions. If you'd like to be a part of that group, uh, sometime you in the next two months to spend a few hours on the subject, uh, you can call IBN and leave your name and number, and then we will get back to you, inshallah. Uh, a special session devoted to money and in particular to electronic money that is coming. Uh, we are living in very, very disturbing times uh, during these last uh, few weeks, we have had hurricanes. In this part of the world, the Caribbean and North America, and they have taken a terrible toll, destroying homes, destroying villages, killing people, destroying infrastructure. Hurricanes at 160, 170, 180 kilometers an hour, or is it miles an hour? I don't know which one. And in addition to that, we have earthquakes. Massive earthquake in, um, in Mexico mm. and in other places. And I understand we just had one in Trinidad last night, maybe three on the Richter scale. And I had a dream of a, what you call it, the chus, chas, chasfun, where the earth is an, an earthquake in which the earth opens and swallows what it swallows. I just had that dream last night. Um, the Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, spoke about earthquakes and uh, these things in the end times. That there will be many earthquakes in the end times. But in particular, remember, he spoke about three massive earthquakes. Three of the ten major signs of the last day. Uh, the, he called them khusuf, which is the plural of Chas, an earthquake in which the earth opens and swallows what it swallows, like a sinkhole. And I thought that maybe the tsunami, tsunami of, was it 2004, where underneath the earth, underneath the ocean, there was this chas, uh, maybe an, uh, an atomic uh, bomb was exploded or whatever it was, and it created this massive tsunami. And I thought maybe that was the first chas of the East. And if that was true, then there's one to come in the West. I don't know where it will be. And then will come the third one, which will be in Arabia. Uh, that Imam al-Mahdi will proclaim himself to be the Mahdi in Mecca. And then an army will come from Sham to attack him. If an army is coming to attack the Imam al-Mahdi, it indicates that Sham or Syria will still be in a state of armed insurrection up to that time when the Mahdi comes. There will be no peace in Syria from now until that time because this army is coming from the north 
to attack the Imam. And uh, between Medina and Mecca, there will be this massive earthquake and this khas, the earth opens and swallows that army. And that will be the sign which confirms that this is the Imam al-Mahdi, not any eclipse in the sky or so. This is the major sign that this is the Imam al-Mahdi. So this is the time of earthquakes. This is the time of hurricanes. And we should therefore wake up and not be sleeping. I learned while I was in France a term that my grandmother's sister used to use because she was very old. She died in 1975 at the age of 104. And because of in her childhood, the, the French expressions were still used in Trinidad. She always used these French expressions. So for going to sleep, she used to say, Dodo, fed Dodo, go to sleep. For the children, fed Dodo, go to sleep. And this term Dodo is still used uh, in Trinidad. I heard it just yesterday. Dodo for sleeping. And that's, what's, that's what we have to say today about so many people in the world today, that they're still in the state of Dodo while we are living in the most dangerous times of all, the end time, the time of Dajjal, when there will be trials and tribulations and matters will cause tremendous distress. And also, in these end times, it will be very easy to lose your faith. Yes, so many attacks on religion, on the religious way of life, that you very easily can lose your faith. And you believe you're a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew and you die and you find out you're not. You've lost it. Hmm? Uh, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu waslam, and you can tell your friends of this as well, uh, reach out this hadith to them, this prophecy, that it will be so easy to lose your Islam, your faith, in the end times that a man will wake in the morning and lose his faith before the day has ended. He wakes up in the morning as a believer, as a mu'min, one who has faith. And by the time the night comes, he's lost it. In one day, you can lose your faith. And a man will go to sleep as a mu'min, having faith in his heart. And by the time he wakes up in the morning, his faith is lost. So in one night, you can lose your faith so easily that you can lose your faith in this time, the end times. And that's what we are lecturing on, the signs of the times. We know that we are living in the end times, don't we? Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, did he not say about the end times? You know it, don't you? that women will be dressed and yet naked? Of course, you see it every day and you walk on the streets, you go to the shopping malls and you see women dressed and yet naked. And when you see that, it should cause you to shiver with fear because you know this is a sign of the end time, the time when the religious way of life will be under attack. And people will lose their faith to such an extent that the Prophet also prophesied that 999 out of every 1,000 will enter into the hellfire in the end time. Only one for heaven. Only one for heaven. If that does not wake us up, what else can wake us, will wake us up? Is it that all of us will remain in the state of dodo? Huh? Just do do while all of these things are happening around us and we will not wake up. So the hurricanes which are taking place should wake us up. The earthquakes which are taking place should wake us up. Maybe another massive earthquake coming soon. Who knows? These are signs which should wake us up from our do do wake us up so we can pay attention 
to what guidance has come from Allah and from his messenger. How do we understand the world in which we live today? And how do we respond to it appropriately? In current events, very, very interesting things, disturbing things taking place around the world. Before we return to our subject of money, maybe you can allow me to comment briefly on these current events that are taking place. There is a country which used to be called Burma, Burma. Uh, but they now have changed the name to Myanmar, from Burma, Myanmar. And uh, the, the capital is Rangoon. I don't know whether they changed the name also from Rangoon. And uh, we, there is a community of mus Muslims living in Myanmar. Uh, they're called the Rohingya, I think. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And they are Muslims who originally belonged to Bengal and had migrated and settled in Myanmar, which is a Buddhist country. Uh, Buddhism is a religion of peace. Buddhism is a religion of non-violence. I studied Buddhism uh, as a student at the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies, and indeed my first book that I wrote was on Islam and Buddhism in the modern world. I had a tremendous teacher. His name was Professor Yusuf Salim Chishti, who taught me the subject of Buddhism. And uh, after studying the religion of Buddhism, I developed great love in my heart for Gautama Buddha as a wonderful man and a tremendous, tremendous spiritual guide, Gautama Buddha. And uh, it was a religion of peace and of non-violence. And so it is something strange and mysterious that in Myanmar there should be so much violence directed against a helpless community of Muslims who have no weapons to defend themselves. They're small in number. And uh, you're using the weapons of mass uh, uh, killing, slaughter, violence, rape, all of these things. It's like Kashmir all over again. Why are the Buddhists behaving like this? How do we explain it? And it has been going on for a number of years now, this violence. Some of the Rohingya have left Burma or Myanmar and have gone to Bangladesh. And I remember when I visited Bangladesh for the last time, was it in 2003, about 14 years ago, and we traveled down to the south of Bangladesh, to uh, uh, Chittagong, and then to Cox's Bazaar, and then to Teknaf, which is the southernmost end of Bangladesh, Teknaf. And there in Teknaf, I saw the refugee camps of the Rohingya, who had come to Bangladesh from uh, uh, Myanmar, as refugees and were living in squalor. Um, but there's so many more in Myanmar and now there is this massive slaughter of the Myanmar Muslims by the Burmese military, it appears. And uh, so many have been writing to me asking me to comment on the subject. Uh, the it would be preferable that those who live in that region and who are scholars of Islam and who have more knowledge of the subject than I do, more intimate knowledge of the subject than I do, and the historical antecedents of the subject, that they should be the ones who should comment rather than me. But uh, my comment from far away Trinidad is that I smell, smell something bad. I smell that this is a part of a universal problem of war on Islam. To try to intimidate Muslims, to try to terrify Muslims, to try to break their morale, 
and uh, to try to make Islam look bad in the world. That there is problem between Islam and Hindu India. There is problem between Islam and Jewish Israel. There is problem between Islam and the Christian world. And now there is problem between Islam and the Jewish world. So Islam must be a terrible religion. That everybody in, in conflict with Islam. This seems to me to be part of the master plan. Uh, why, why the Buddhists are being provoked to attack the Rohingya Muslims again and again. Because it forms part of a master plan that is universal in character. And there is a mastermind at work to ensure that this takes place in the Buddhist world. Who is that mastermind? Of course we know. The mastermind is those who want the state of Israel to replace the United States of America as the next ruling state in the world. If you do not understand that subject, do please take a little time and read my book entitled Jerusalem in the Quran. Uh, it's available on my website, imranhussein.org. Uh, you can download it free of charge. You can also order it from my bookstore, imranhussein.com, which will explain to you the subject of uh, Israel wanting to rule the world. But I believe that there is also a pay master at work. And it will be good if someone or some group in that part of the world will conduct the necessary investigations to seek to provide, to, to obtain the evidence that the people are being paid. Yes, they're being paid to go and attack the Muslim Rohingya. If this is being done, we must know who is the paymaster and expose him before the world because no lie can survive forever. 9-11 didn't survive for too long. The whole world knows now it's a lie. So no lie can survive forever. Eventually a lie will be exposed. So if there are those who are paying Buddhists to go and attack Muslims in Myanmar, this will one day be exposed and we need to have it investigated to find out what is the truth over there. How then should we respond in Burma or Myanmar to this intense oppression? Well, it's the same thing. How should we respond, respond in Kashmir, where an Indian government is betraying the Hindu religion? We have respect for the Hindu religion. We can recognize in Hinduism traces of truth from the earliest time of all. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he ordered the angels to bow down and prostrate before Adam alayhi salam. Fasajadu. And they prostrated before Adam alayhi salam. Because prostration at that time in history was an act of respect and reverence. Prostration now is prohibited, but at that time it was permissible. And up to this day, the Hindus have preserved it. That a Hindu wife, there are others, of course, who are going to be feeling bad in their stock, but we don't care two peanuts for how they feel about it. The Hindu woman up to this day bows down and touches her husband's foot in respect and reverence. You can like it or you don't like it. We don't care two peanuts for your, your views. But this is Hinduism preserving a part of the truth which existed at the earliest time in history. The Hindu, the Indian government is betraying the Hindu religion at time and again. And it's time for Hindu scholarship to stand up and denounce the Indian government for what it's doing. The oppression of Kashmir is something that betrays the Hindu religion, really. And there's more that I'd like to say on the subject of Kashmir, but we leave that for another time. What do you do when you face intense oppression and you do not have the power to be able to protect yourself? Let me repeat that question. What do you do when you are a believer and you're facing intense oppression because you're a believer, for example? 
And you do not have the power to be able to resist the oppressor. Your houses are being destroyed. You're being injured, you're being killed, your women are being raped. Your children are suffering. What do you do? Answer, Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, and the Muslims face precisely that situation in Makkah, which our people are facing today in the Holy Land, in Gaza, in Israel. What do you do? What did they do in Makkah? Makkah is the holy of, of cities. It's the center of the world for the Arab. Makkah. And yet they made hijrah. Yes, they made hijrah. They left sacred, blessed Makkah. Ummul Qura, the mother of all cities. They left Makkah to go to a place where there was more security. And so they went to Medina. And so my advice to the Muslims of Myanmar, my advice to the Muslims of Kashmir, those who are willing to listen to my advice, not everybody willing to listen, not even here in Trinidad. So my advice is if you are facing oppression and you lack the capacity to resist the oppressor and oppression becomes so intense that you cannot bear it anymore, then the, the, the guidance from the Quran and from the Sunnah a prophet, Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, is to leave wherever you are and seek sanctuary and safety in some other place. Allah's earth is wide, and if you make the effort to make hijrah, Allah can open doors for you where even there are no doors. I don't think all the Muslims of Kashmir will take that advice, no. But those who wish to follow my advice that I extend to you lovingly as a brother who loves you is to leave Kashmir and find sanctuary somewhere else where you will not be so oppressed. Leave Myanmar if you can and find sanctuary somewhere else. However, how do you leave a country when you have nowhere to go? This is a subject we'll take up inshallah in another session when we deal on political philosophy. We have a situation now in Kashmir in which Pakistan is, has become the target. And uh, the rhetoric between India and Pakistan is intensifying to such an extent that there is a greater fear of war today than for many, many moons in the past. Hmm? And it is necessary for us to direct attention once again to Pakistan, as we have done many times in the past, and to India's role, India's role in this encirclement of Pakistan in order to try to finish off this country of Pakistan. That seems to be the master plan, to make Pakistan a subservient state to those who want to control power in the world. Mm. How do we respond to that? I cannot, in this little time that we now have left, just 10 minutes, uh, devote uh, time to this subject now. But it is clearly a very dangerous situation in India and Pakistan. And the scholars of Hinduism and the scholars of Islam ought to be coming together to put your heads together, to try to see how we can resolve, how we can guide our people in these dangerous times. I have respect for the Hindu religion. I have many Hindu friends who are listening to this lecture as I speak. And I hope and pray that it's possible for us to come together, the scholars of Islam and the scholars of Hinduism, to see how we can guide our people when our governments are betraying us. Over there you have an Indian government that is betraying Hinduism. And over there in Pakistan for the longest while it has been the American Republic of Pakistan. Yes, the American Republic of Pakistan until Donald Trump came and opened their eyes what it means to be an American Republic of Pakistan. Before we end our brief, brief comments on current affairs, we need to touch on Korea. 
we need to touch on Korea, and uh, we have to speak uh, a little bit uh, with a little bit more um, did, uh, a little bit more extensively on the subject of Korea because it is it is perhaps the most dangerous one we face in the world at this time. Uh, there was a war in Korea imposed upon the Korean people by the United States of America, supported by people in the south of Korea, a war which was unleashed on the north of Korea, a war of aggression, a war which sought to demolish the north and to make it submit to the Americans. That's what it was in Korea in the 1950s. And uh, the North fought bravely and could not be subdued. No. They suffered tremendously. I don't know, maybe over two million of them were killed in that war. And they've not forgotten. They've not forgotten what happened uh, 60, 70 years ago. And for these 60 or 70 years, they have been preparing themselves for when they will be attacked again. They knew that unless and until they build the power with which to deter the aggressor, they knew that when next they attack, they could be subdued. And so what they did was to build such power as to be able to deter the aggressor. That's all they did. They never built power to try to control the world. They don't, want, they don't have an agenda of building Korean bases in 900 parts of the world to ensure that they become the policemen of the world. No, Korea does not have that as agenda. It's the United States of America which has this agenda to be the world's policeman. In the Quran, Allah has given an order in Surah Al-Anfal. And today we ask our people to remember what Allah has said in the Quran. Listen to the word of Allah. The Security Council could like it or dislike it. It matters not to us. This is the word of the one God. He says, and it's a command, وَعِدُّوا لَهُمْ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ وَمِنْ رِبَاطِ الْخَيْلِ Build power, says Allah. Meaning, military power. Build power. Build it to the maximum extent that you can possibly build it. Not to the extent permitted by the Security Council. Not to the extent permitted by Washington or London or Paris. Not to the extent permitted by NATO, not to the extent permitted by a Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance, and most certainly not to the extent permitted by the state of Israel. No. Allah says in the Quran, He says, build power, meaning military power, build it to the maximum extent that you can possibly build it. Why? Does Allah want us to build power? Why? Is it to intimidate mankind? Is it to commit aggression? Is it to seek to expand territory through warfare? Is it to seek to rule the world? To establish Pax Britannica? Or to establish Pax Americana? Or to establish what's now coming, Pax Judaica? Is it to rule the world? No, 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 a thousand times no. The Quran does not give us that agenda. No. Rather, it gives us a philosophy of power in which it says, Turhibuna bihi adu wallahi wa aduwakum. Bill power to the maximum extent that you can possibly build it in order that it might function as deterrence 
to deter those who may want to attack you. That is precisely what Korea has done. That is what Pakistan did when Pakistan developed a nuclear deterrence. But they don't want you to have such power. They want that you should be so weak that they can come and maul you and they can stamp their foot upon you and they can make you subservient to them. That's what they want because they want to rule the world by the hook or by the crook. And Korea said, no, we will not submit. And so Korea was right. Korea was justified. And Korea was in conformity with the divine guidance in the Quran to build such power as to be able to deter those who had committed aggression against her in the first place and now have stood up in the United Nations General Assembly and threatened to destroy Korea. When that statement was made in the United Nations General Assembly, it vindicated the Korean decision to build that kind of power to be able to deter. They can't attack Korea. No. They have to wait until Korea attacks them before they can respond. They cannot. Because if they were to attack Korea, the whole of South Korea will be destroyed immediately. 30, 20, 30 million people will die immediately and they'll have that sin on their head. And therefore they cannot attack Korea. Why? Because Korea has the power with which to be able to deter. I wish I could speak some more on the subject, but we are running out of time now. We want to open the lines for you if you'd like to call. Uh, if you want to call from abroad, you can also call. The numbers are on the screen. Um, uh, on the subjects that we are uh, speaking about today. Um, I want to continue now with, uh, while we're waiting on your calls, with uh, the news that uh, several of my books have now been translated to French. Yeah, alhamdulillah. And uh, the new book, which is almost com completed, uh, the Dajjal, the Quran, and uh, the beginning of history uh, is already <laughs> translated to French, most of it, and it should soon be uh, uh, translated completely to French. We probably have about 10 books now in French, and we'd like to have them published in France. So I'm going to be making a, an announcement soon, inshallah, on... Um, uh, uh, an, an appeal so that we can get the funds, inshallah, to be able to uh, to be able to publish these books in France. And uh, um, I would also like to speak to you about uh, the Institute of uh, Islamic Eschatology in the north of Malaysia. But we have two questions now. Um, sent to me. I have it here in writing. Uh, one is from Iran and he asks, I won't mention your name, don't worry. You can send your questions. Uh, if you don't want to speak on the phone, you can send your questions to IBN and they will write it down and give it to me. And if you want to call, the numbers are at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the question is, will Dajjal come during the time of digital money, will he establish it or will he end it? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Yes, that's a good question. Uh, will the Dajjal come during the time when digital money is established or will he come to establish it or will he come at the end of digital money? <laughs> Let me take you to the Hadith. Uh, Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam uh, has spoken on the subject of the khuruj of Dajjal. Khuruj meaning appearing in human form. Khuruj meaning appearing in human form. I know that you have in Iran 
so many institutes of eschatology, but over there you call it Ilmul Mahdawiyah mm-hmm. in Iran. I have visited so many of them, and I have entered into dialogue with so many of the Iranian ulama on the subject. Now, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, the hadith is in the sunan of uh, Abu Dawood. And he said, Umran ubayt al-Maqdis kharabu yatrib. That when Jerusalem is built up, center stage, flourishing, at that time, yatrib, and incidentally, the name of the city in the Quran is Yatrib. Allah refers to that city as Yatrib. And the Prophet ﷺ refers to the city as Yatrib. And therefore the Sunnah of the Quran and of the Prophet is to refer to the city as Yatrib. Which is why it seems to me, I cannot understand, I'm puzzled, why did they rename the city Madina? Al Munawwara. I prefer to use the name that is in the Quran. I prefer to use the name which is in the Hadith, which is in the Sunnah. Hmm? The name in the Quran and in the Sunnah is Yatrib. Today it is known as Madina or Madina Al Munawwara. Al Madina Al Munawwara. And it is located about 800 kilometers to the north of Makkah. So when Jerusalem is built up flourishing center stage in the world. At that time, Yatrib, which today is known as Medina, would be Kharabu Yatrib. Medina will have no status. <laughs> Medina will, in, will be in desolation, full on desolation, Kharabu Yatrib. When these two things are in place, and they are in place today, Kharabu Yatrib Khurujul Malhama. At that time, the Malhama will take place. The Christians know it as Armageddon. It's the great, 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 great war, which will substantially reduce the population of the world. You may probably have it in Hindu scriptures and in Buddhist scriptures as well. I don't know. But we have it in, in, in Islam and the Christians have it. The great, 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 great war, which will substantially reduce the population of the world. It's called the Malhama. Then said the Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, Khurujul Malhama Fathul Constantinia. Please hold on with your phone call. Let me answer the question. We'll come to you. Khurujul Malhama Fathul Constantinia. That when the Malhama takes place, the next event that takes place after that would be the conquest of Constantinople. They don't want us to know that. That's why they changed the name of the city from Constantinople to Istanbul. And they gave us this nonsense that the conquest of Constantinople took place five, six hundred years ago, when the Malhama has not as yet taken place. After the conquest of Constantinople, the next event after that would be the Khuruj of Dajjal. Meaning Dajjal will appear in human form. He's already here. The way the angels are here, the way the jinn are here. But you can't see him. The way you cannot see the angels, you cannot see the jinn. Dajjal is here. But Dajjal will appear in human form at that time. Digital money is already here. So we can say that digital money is, the architect of digital money is Dajjal. Yes. And the digital money will probably take over the world within the next uh, maybe one year, two years, three years. Uh, the Wall Street is using uh, the Indian government as a guinea pig. And the Indian government is playing ball. They just, last November, they demonetized the two biggest Indian rupee notes, 500 and 1,000. And I expect the government of Trinidad and Tobago to do the same thing with the 100 dollar note, yeah, all of them, the big notes will be demonetized, part and parcel of the demolition of paper money so that digital money could replace paper money. Will Dajjal end the digital monetary system? That is a very, very interesting question. Iran, I'm glad you asked it. Uh, I have very little time. Yes. 
the jar will have to end the bogus and fraudulent and haram monetary system of paper, plastic, and electronic money. Why? Because every Jew knows that this is not kosher, meaning this is not halal. This is not legally permitted in the sacred law. Every Jew knows that money in the temple in Jerusalem, that temple of David and of Solomon, Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam, that temple in Jerusalem used to mint its own money. Every Jew knows that. And uh, the Roman government used to also mint their own money, but they had a graven image on the coin, gold and silver coins. And that was haram, or prohibited, not kosher. So you couldn't use that money in the temple. So the temple minted its own money. Every Jew knows that. And people will have to go to the temple and change their Roman money for temple money, gold and silver coins. And the people, the money changers, were ripping them off. And that is why Jesus, when he entered the temple, he cursed them. He turned over their tables. He chased them out of the temple. Jesus did it. And he said, you've taken the house of God and transformed it into a den of thieves. So money in Christianity, money in Judaism, money in Islam, and I'm sure, I'm sure money in Hinduism as well, if the Hindu scholars will confirm it, is money with gold and silver coins. That there you have uh, integrity of money intact. And so Dajjal will have to put an end to this monetary system and restore gold and silver coins as money. Thank you, Iran. Let's take this call. Hello? Call, are you there? Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Yeah, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'd like to know uh, the reason why that three and three quarter million Jews in Israel controlling the whole of the Islamic whole in the Middle East. I never said that. Did I say that? No, you didn't. I say that. Why did <laughs> I never said that. No, there is a Judeo-Christian alliance in the world today. And I'm sure you know about it. Yes. That Judeo-Christian alliance has given us, uh, taken control of power in modern Western civilization. They control the American Congress. You cannot, con you cannot criticize Israel in the United States as a politician and survive. You know that, don't you? Yes, I know. You know that, yeah? The same thing in Britain, the same thing in France, and the same thing in Germany. There is, a, there is a very, very powerful force at work. So it's not just Israel controlling the world. No. <laughs> it is modern Western civilization acting on Israel's behalf. Modern Western civilization emerged with one ruling state, Britain, as the ruling state. Yeah. And that time when Britain was the ruling state was called Pax Britannica. And then the United States took over from Britain, and the United States wants to rule the world, and it's called Pax Americana. And now we're living to the, at that moment in history, of course, Donald Trump doesn't know it, when the United States is now in irreversible decline. Yes, irreversible decline. You can't stop it. The United States is going down. Yeah, they Why? Just now. Why is the United States going down? Why? Because there's a third ruling state which has to emerge in history to replace Britain and the United States, and that's Israel. And they have an agenda of ruling the whole world, not just the Middle East, the whole world. Yes, Kuala? Yeah, what about the Burmese people? There's so many army the Muslim will have, they could defend the, the Burmese Rohingya Muslim. It is not a question of Israel alone ruling the Middle East. No, that is a very uh, <laughs> inadequate expression. It is modern Western world wanting to rule the whole world. They send their armies into India to control India, okay? Yes. And Hindu India tried to resist them under Gandhi. Muslim India tried to resist them under the uh, Muslim Khilafat movement. 
trying to resist the Western world wanting to control the whole of India. And you had a Hindu-Muslim alliance in India trying to resist this oppression. Hmm? So it's not just Israel. It is the Western world wanting to, having an agenda, an imperialist agenda of wanting to rule the whole world. And if Russia, if Russia refuses to, to submit to them, they want to wage war on Russia. If China refuses to submit to them, they want to wage war on China. And if Korea refuses to submit to them, they want to wage war on Korea. And if Hugo Chavez and Venezuela refuses to submit to them, look what they're doing to Venezuela. Yeah, okay? what they're doing to Maduro. Yeah, okay. okay. Any more questions? All right. We have a question here. It looks like uh, Malaysia. Uh, and the questioner, the question has, questioner has asked, Are the Hindu and the Buddhist considered as pagans? For there is a verse in the Quran which says that the people with the most hatred for Muslims will be the Jews and the pagans. The Quran does not say that. You must be careful. You must be careful when you're quoting the Quran. You must give the Arabic text of the Quran carefully because I'm now 75 years of age, I've spent my life studying the Quran, and now at this age I realize the Quran cannot be translated. The Quran cannot be translated. No, all we can try to do is to explain the Quran. We cannot translate the Quran. Whenever we offer something, don't say it's a translation. You better say it's an explanation, and Allah knows best when you explain. No, the Quran does not say that those who will have the greatest hatred for Muslims will be Jews and pagans. No, what does the Quran say? It says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, "Wala tajidan ba'dauzi billahi min al-shaytani rajim." We have a few minutes left. "Wala tajidan," and you will most certainly find. At this time and in time to come. But at this time meaning when the Quran was revealed and in time to come because the Arabic grammar indicates both present and future. And you will most certainly find Ashaddan nasi adawatan lilathina amanul yahud that you will find those who have the greatest hatred for you would be a people who are Jews as well as the people who commit shirk, who commit shirk. What is shirk? It's blasphemy. A people who blaspheme against the Lord God. If the Lord God has said that a girl can get married at the age of 16 and 17, and you say, no, she can only be married at the age of 18, you've committed blasphemy against the Lord God, and you don't know it, and you will face that, you face judgment day in a pathetic situation. Yes, it's better for you to keep your mouth shut than to open your mouth to blaspheme against the Lord God. Yeah. There is no law in Christianity. There is no law in Hinduism. There is no law in Judaism. There is no law in Islam or in Buddhism which says that you cannot get married at the age of 17. But in their godless situ civilization, they say, no, she has to be 18 before she can be married. This is shirk. The Quran does not speak of paganism. It speaks of blasphemy. The verse goes on to say, at that time when the Jews have the greatest hatred for you, which occurred at that time when the Quran was revealed, and it's occurring again today. Look at Gaza. Look at the Holy Land. Look at the oppression there. It is occurring again today. Those who blaspheme against the Lord God at that time hated us the most. And again, they're waging war against, against Islam today. Those who are waging war on Islam today are a people who blaspheme against the Lord God. But the verse continues to say something more. And I have to share it with you in the little time that we have. Allah says, at that time when the Jews have the greatest hatred for you and the people who blaspheme against the Lord God, they have the greatest hatred for you. 
you will most certainly find that those who have the greatest love and affection for you would be a people who declare proudly, so we are Christians. This is what the Quran says, that they will be a Christian people in the end time who will be the closest in love for you Muslims. It couldn't be Washington, which is only spewing bloodshed and hatred and war on Islam. It couldn't be London, it couldn't be Washington, Paris, no. Well, where are these Christians who will be the closest in love and affection for Muslims in the end time? ذَٰلِكَ لَبِأَنَّ مِنْهُمْ كِسِّسِينَ وَرُحْبَانَ وَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ That Allah says you recognize them not only because they are proud to be Christian, they declare that we are Christian, they're not secular, but also because they have the institution of the priesthood intact. The priest occupies the highest status in society in that Christian world. And they have monasticism. They don't have monastery, monasteries sold to McDonald's, hamburgers, and Kentucky Fry. Their monasteries are still intact, and the monastic way of life is still thriving amongst them. And they honor them. And these Christians will have the greatest love and affection for you Muslims in the end time because they're not an arrogant people. They are not an arrogant people. People. They don't want to rule the world. They don't want to force Korea to submit to them even at the point of Assad. No. This is what the Quran says. Are Hindus pagans? Are Buddhist pagans? I just said to you, I studied Buddhism as a student. I wrote a book on Islam and Buddhism. And at the end of studying the subject of Buddhism, I developed in my heart the great, great love and affection and respect for Gautama Buddha. And this is an Islamic scholar talking to you. I developed great love in my heart for Gautama Buddha. Read my book and you see what I say about Buddhism. And about Hinduism, I have respect for the Hindu religion. In every religion there is corruption. If you want to talk about corruption in Hinduism, I could talk about a lot of corruption in Islam. Oh yes, give me the time and I'll show you how much corruption we have in Islam as well, okay? Every religion has its rotten apples. But that does not mean you're gonna throw, every, throw away the whole religion. No, there is in Hinduism truth, and it is for you to respect that truth when you find it in Hinduism. And don't dismiss the whole Hindu world as pagan. That is wrong. That is false. We have come to the end now. There are no more calls. And inshallah, uh, uh, in a few days' time, I hope that there will be an interview I did in Geneva uh, with a Roman Catholic, uh, pre um, a Roman Catholic uh, um, organization at the United Nations in Geneva. Um, a news organization in Geneva at the, United, at the Palais des Nations. Uh, they interviewed me and that interview should come on my YouTube channel in the next few days, inshallah. And I'll also be recording maybe another one or two lectures uh, on the Institute of Islamic Eschatology and on my books in French, inshallah, in the next few days. So please stay tuned. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank <laughs> you.